and just, you know, huh, we are recording. Yes. Hello and welcome everyone to the Arts Showcase, CFA's Arts Showcase for 2021. We are online and it is just amazing that we can get together in technology and that we can see all of your incredible performances and this swift adaptation, you know, adapting that we've done literally I mean last year I remember everyone was going crazy trying to get their presentations done you know because we we're in the midst of COVID and now that we've had a year to see also the progress and how everyone has adapted to this medium and forum and so I just again I can't wait to, to see all your presentations and hear all your presentations and we're going to start with Kate so Kate please take it away Absolutely. Let me get my screen share set up. Quickly. Beautiful. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Kate Phillip. I am a theater arts major, dance minor, and graduating in December. And I am going to start presenting my senior thesis project on how an actor learns and uh, prepares the standard English RP accent. Now, when I talk about RP, I'm talking about the received pronunciation of the English accent, and it's deemed received because it was historically an educational accent. So it was taught in schools and deemed the approved or standard way one should speak. So it's going to focus on pr the precision of each word and of each sound. And examples of this accent are present in a lot of popular period pieces, some of which I watched for research purposes. Thank you, Bridgerton. Uh, and specifically regarding the crown, this type of accent has been prominently used by the royal family and the queen definitely has a very um, very conservative form of the RP accent. There are some more variations today, um, but that's a lot of who has historically spoken it. Um, older BBC news broadcasters use this accent as well as many uh, plays, those of Oscar Wilde, Noel Coward, and one I recently saw in London, which was Connor McPherson's Uncle Vanya. So this brings me to why research the specific accent. So I was introduced to it while taking dialects in the fall of my sophomore year. And then the next semester I studied abroad in London and absolutely fell in love with the theater industry there. I am determined to live there and work there as an actor. And that made me realize that proficiency in this accent is probably of an increased importance to me. So given this inspiration and motivation, I wanted to revisit what I had learned in my dialects class and spend more time with the accent in order to achieve this proficiency. So my research process highlighted the four P's of people, posture, pronunciation, and prosody. So I began refreshing what I had learned in class with the history of the accent, its origins, who spoke it, uh, which it's an upper class accent, as I mentioned, and was really only available to the educated Londoners uh, throughout most of history. And then I moved on to revisiting the more technical aspects of learning the accent. So the vowel and consonant substitutions, how one's mouth will change uh, to produce the correct sound, for these changes and among other pronunciations of words that are said differently than how we speak them with an American accent. And then finally, I moved on to the prosody of the accent. So what kind of rhythm, stress patterns, intonation patterns, and musicality that speakers are going to have when they speak with this accent. Having taken in this information once more, uh, it became time to actually make use of it for acting purposes. And that started my application and exploration portion of my research. So spending lots of time practicing the accent, playing with the changes in oral posture and the rhythm of speaking different words with these different changes. This uh, diagram shows sort of an easier um, way of understanding how the tongue and mouth will change shape, even when we just speak these words with an American accent. And that helps you then figure out how to change the shape of your mouth and the tongue 
in order to um, make those vowel changes for the audience. So specifically to give a demonstration, if you're talking and then you wanna make some changes to make it sound a little more RP, you're going to raise the draw and then pull your lips back in the corner of attraction and drop your velum. Just a little example, but you'll be seeing more in a little bit. And um, this technical application is great, but as an actor, there's still another, another step needed, which is applying this to text and including it with actual acting. So uh, as a culmination of my research work, I've applied the accent to two pieces of some dramatic text, one of which, this first one, is a paragraph from Jane Austen's novel, Emma, and the next will be a BBC broadcast of the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana. And with these texts, um, and as sort of a deeper research, I wanted to show how the same accent can still have differences based on what it's applied to. Um, seeing as an actor is never going to play their, their roles in the exact same way and speak in the same way or have the mannerisms in the same way, but they're all still RP accent. And I do want to address that um, what you're seeing are works in progress. <laughs> I've been working on these for a time, but um, oral ch posture changes and proficiency still takes time to grow and develop. So this is an example of where I'm at now, but we still have some more weeks in the semester for my senior thesis to grow even more. And with that, here is the first of the two videos. How long had Mr. Knightley been so dear to her as every feeling declared him now to be? When had his influence, such influence, begun? When had he succeeded to that place in her affection which Frank Churchill had once, for a short period, occupied? She looked back, she compared the two, compared them as they had always stood in her estimation from the time of the latter's becoming known to her. And as they must at any time have been compared by her, had it, oh, had it by any blessed felicity occurred to her to institute the comparison. She saw that there never had been a time when she did not consider Mr. Knightley as infinitely superior, or when his regard for her had not been infinitely the most dear. She saw that in persuading herself, in fancying, in acting to the contrary, she had been entirely under a delusion, totally ignorant of her own heart, and, in short, that she had never really cared for Frank Churchill at all. How long? Here is the BBC broadcast. Wedding day in London. Fine weather, ceremony, and celebration. In the early morning, the route was already lined with thousands of people waiting especially to cheer at the first glimpse of the bride. Leaving Clarence House in the glass coach, her father by her side, Lady Diana Spencer. In St. Paul's, with his two brothers, Prince Charles moved slowly down the aisle as exactly on time his bride arrived. The bride's mother looked on as the walk to the altar began. After the ceremony, a smile from the Queen as her daughter-in-law curtsied. The crowd roared with approval as the Prince and Princess of Wales appeared. Bells and flags and banners, cheering and waving a royal progress through London. Then all eyes were on the balcony at Buckingham Palace, and for the crowd, a special moment. After the wedding breakfast, rose petals showered the couple as they set off on honeymoon. The open carriage went down the mall to more cheers, with heart-shaped balloons bobbing, and a traditional notice tacked on the back, the work of Prince Charles Brothers. Over Westminster Bridge at a brisk trot, it set off a little late for the royal train. And here are some of the resources I've used in my research. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Yay! Love it. Yes, 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 yes. All right. 
um, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Any questions, anyone? Um, Fauci, yes, please go for it. I was I was wondering if there are other. Um, I was wondering why you didn't, I guess, use the traditional word of like a British accent. Is that, are there different types of British accents? Is that why the RP was used as like the terminology? I just um, wanted to get more clarification on that. Yes, thank you for asking your question. So um, yeah, if you were to just kind of say like, oh, a British accent, there's so many different variations because really every um, different, I don't want to even say like, county or area, like different cities have different accents depending on where they are geographically across like, mm. the whole island. Um, so like a Manchester accent is going to sound very different than like a central London accent is going to sound different than um, like down in Leeds, like and York is very distinctly different. Um, so because there's so many different ones, it um, you just have to get really specific with it. And even to just say like a London, well, there's lots of different like London accents. Um, and especially like nowadays, there's a more contemporary like MLE London accent. Um, but RP is used a lot more in traditional the theatrical settings. Um, and that's kind of where I want to take my career. And so it just felt more uh, important for me to study that one first. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I see that you have a question. I do, actually. Great work. Uh, first, a suggestion. I think that you should most definitely audition for the next season of The Crown because you're perfect to play Princess Kate. <laughs> and it's just with a name and a figure and a speech. So please, I can, I can represent you on that. You get it. Second is a question, actually which would be how much did you discover in this and any accent work, but in this particular one, because it's obvious because you're using two such a different things like Jane Austen and then this documentaristic material. How much did you discover that by working on dialect and, and, and speech, you are delivering characters simultaneously? How much that dialect brings you because there was a distinguished character work in these two. I don't know if it's only based on accent or is it based, anyway, if you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I think the work definitely went hand in hand, but as I was focusing a little harder on the accent, some of that character work became a little easier for me to do, especially in regards to the BBC, because I was, since that's a little less like, oh, there's text to give you information on how to be a character, it's more just normal people presenting, but I have to kind of don a different... <laughs> presentation of myself for it that was giving me a little more trouble and not necessarily coming across the right way but in having to really focus on raising my jaw I felt so constricted as an actor because I'm way more expressive than that usually um but in the end it helped me I feel present myself a little more as like a no-nonsense news BBC broadcaster um, so I definitely think it went hand in hand. Um, I started with character work for the Emma piece first and then started applying more and more of like the accent work to it. Um, Thank you. Because of time, um, there's a question in the chat. So Kate, I'd love for you to answer it in the chat so that we can start our next presentation so that Robin gets the, because I love the question. And so please also for everyone, feel free to utilize the chat. Because we have time restraints, we have to move on to our next presenter, Lily. Yay. So Lily, take the stage. And Kate, thank you so much. That was wonderful. All right. Thank you, Kate. That was awesome to hear. Let me share my screen. Okay, so my name is Lily Maples. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a double dance and sociology major, uh, graduating senior as well. And today I am presenting some of my thesis research entitled Moved Powers, Creating a Safe and Equitable Studio Space. So Moved Powers is a film that explores the thin and often unclear divide between the development of healthy sexuality and the hypersexualization of dance students. 
In July of 2020, there was an influx in the commercial industry of women expressing dancers, speaking up about the hypersexualization and abuse that they had experienced in what was supposed to be a safe studio space. I finally felt comfortable to share my own story with the Dance Safe, an organization that helped me cope through movement and empowered me to use my own creative voice to help others process their traumas. I worked closely with the Dance Safe and Dance Education Equity Association to examine power dynamics, a lack of boundaries, and promotion of exploitation, specifically of young women in the commercial dance industry. So this project started with the intention of analyzing how the lack of safety affects dancers. So for this particular research project, I focused specifically on younger women in competitive dance, pre-professional studios and work settings. And while this project is focused on that one demographic, I also was able to come across the intersecting effects of this issue and dug into how social issues such as racism, transphobia and othering can also hinder the artistic liberation that dance has the potential to bring. In order to conduct a multifaceted array of research, I used qualitative methods to present my findings. The Dance Safe and DEA gave me sources that helped me better understand how movement can actually help cope with sexual trauma. I hunted the internet, finding a range of sources that helped me better understand the history of sexual misconduct and how that fits into dance history. Media was also a great source. I watched films. If you haven't seen Cuties on Netflix already, I highly recommend. It's a great example of how hypersexualization is promoted in young children in dance. Um, I also watched episodes of shows, listened to podcasts, and read critiques pertaining to the above. Sexual exploitation, or sexploitation if you will, can date back to the beginning of ballet being founded. Everything from how dancers were directed to how they were pressured to appear, dress, and how they were touched in a studio setting deeply affected their psychological development. There were also, also wealthy and often male expressing audience members that would quote unquote sponsor the dancers and at the Paris Opera, they were nicknamed abonnés, essentially meaning that their money was exchanged to be able to hang out with the dancers and ask them for favors. So Judith Butler, I also love her work, is a gender theorist and has written about the construction of the gender binary within general society as a whole but also focuses on the male gaze and dance. Presenting women with the idea that their body has to look and move a certain way, not only objectifies them, but further establishes the binary of what feminine and masculine movement looks like. Dance is a communicative platform, especially for young children who are at such an impressionable age. And Melissa Deary had an article that was super helpful to this finding about how as dance educators, it's important to not dismiss the creative process as a whole, but it is even more important to draw boundaries so that children do not feel as though being pushed into a place of sexual discomfort is normal. There's also a general lack of social sensitivity in the portrayal of dance in media. However, if preventative safety measures such as establishing boundaries, providing trigger warnings and teaching consent in the studio space from a young age, it is possible that dance can grow even more in its empathetic nature. So basically my goal in creating this film was to not only create movement motifs that were representative of my own feelings, but also to push audience member, members and educators to think about how dance can actually be a safe space of hope for those looking to escape those feelings of trauma. I used a lot of code words for my research findings to create gestures and movement. Shame, power, performativity, resist, and exposure were among those used to create the gestures for this piece. The makeup and styling was also a fashionable look with slick hair and a black dress and was chosen very intentionally, representing how not only females are told to appear in a dance setting, but also how emotions are often silenced after speaking up, hence the clean and kind of lack of emotion in the appearance. There's also a thin wall that I used as a prop placed between a duet of dancers that represents the metaphorical boundary, allowing the dancers to portray coming to their own terms of past experiences, working through trauma and stepping into a safe and healing place. The film is four parts. Part one, Breath Precedes Upheaval, is an introspective solo where movement motifs are introduced. Part two, Acts, is a duet that represents the two sides of the boundary, mirroring in a state of uncertainty. Part three, Immunity, you'll see this part in the video, is also a duet that shows a bit more of the individual journey. 
And part four, processes framework, is a solo that explores what it means to move forward and how we can cope with trauma and frustration in a dance space by providing the framework needed to reach creative liberation, safety, and accountability in the studio. So with all that said, thank you for listening to the research portion. And here's a preview of the choreography. Thank you so much for watching and a special thanks also to my faculty mentors, Kristen and Laura. Um, if you have any questions about the process after the symposium, please feel free to email me at my line email on the screen. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, because of our time, we probably have time for one question out loud and any other questions, please put them also in the chat and Lily can answer some of these. I know Lily, you also have to go to another presentation, um, but um, if, you know, that's why I wanted to put you up a little bit early. But if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or we can probably have one question out loud. Does anyone have a question for Lily? Incredible research and beautifully placed on the body. Any questions that anyone wants to ask? Just a big cheers, yes. And good luck with your next presentation as you're like heading to the next place. Um, Lily, thank you so much. That was really beautiful. And as Lily said, if you'd like to send any questions, please send them um, her way. Thank you so much. All right, as we are moving along, we have Charlotte and Claire, yay. Let's um, have, 
handing it over to both of y'all and letting y'all, you know, share and present. So the field and the stage is yours. Hi, thank you so much. So my name is Claire. I'm a freshman theater arts major with music and dance minors. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to present the abstract for our Commedia dell'arte presentation. So in this project, we explored the classical theater style of Commedia dell'arte and how to embody these timeless characters. So Lottie will be portraying Il Capitano and I will be playing a character called Columbina. Through our process, we adapted a short open scene. The script was provided to us by our faculty sponsor, Professor Pervon, who's here today. Um, and we turned that into a creative and comedic movement piece that's similar to an authentic Commedia Lazzi, although a little bit shorter. Um, as a team, we created our storyline and we included these traditional characters stanzas and movement styles and we really combined forces to bring this piece to life. Uh, Lottie and I actually became very good friends through working on this piece. And we pushed our creative boundaries and our imaginations and forced ourselves to overcome any fears of vulnerability or embarrassment um, in favor of experimentation and growth. And we believe that it's critical to honor and study the theater of the past in order to truly appreciate the theater of the present and also learn how to be a valuable part of this art form's future and take on the responsibility of being the storytellers of tomorrow. So now Lottie's gonna tell you a little bit about our class last semester and how we came up with this. Yeah, hi, I'm Lottie. I am a freshman theater arts and dance major. Um, and this is a little bit more of our research. So last semester, Claire and I took a uh, movement for actors class with Professor Nano, where he taught us about Comedia dell'arte characters and their basic stanzas um, and some of their character tropes, as Claire mentioned. Um, and the presentation you're about to see is actually what we created for our class final. So for the final presentation, the class was divided up into pairs and we were all given an open scene. Um, and the object of the final was to take this basic and minimal script written by our professor and add a plot um, for one of the assigned characters that we were given. So there were four characters that we studied, Alokino, Capitano, Pierrot, and Columbia. <laughs> Columbia? Columbina, sorry. <laughs> Claire, Claire was assigned Columbina and I was assigned Il Capitano. Um, so for our open scene, it was very subjective, which was exciting because we really wanted to see what we could add with such a minimal script and experiment with creative liberties that we could take. Um, so while staying as close to the original text as possible, we added components of music, dramatic storyline, and some props to try and bring our media world to life. Um, and working over Zoom over 2,000 miles away from each other and three time zones away, uh, we encountered quite a few <laughs> difficulties um, with trying to be physical as comedia is a very physical art form. Um, but we hope that our presentation today will show that no matter what the distance may be, art, acting, and comedy will always serve to bring people together. Um, so without further ado, if I can figure out how to share my screen, I will be sharing our video thing, not that one, just up here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm really bad <laughs> at technology. All right. Um, All right, I think we were, we got a screen. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, I'll click play. Perfect, yes.
When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> uh. Oh, but um, <laughs> but purpose. <laughs> I, I mean. Don't be ridiculous. I'm not stupid, you know. Ah, no. <sighs> you are not stupid. Let's get down to business, to the feet of the hunt. Did they send me daughters when I asked for sons? Your spine is a pathetic lot, and you haven't got a clue. Mr. Ryle, make a man out of you. Hate my every order, but a fire within. Once you find your center, <laughs> no, you are not stupid. <sighs> but you must be joking me. <laughs> Relax now, okay? <laughs> you relax! <laughs> Get out of here now. What a baby. <laughs> And that's it. Thank you for watching. Yay. All right. Congratulations. I'd love to know if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask. Also, please feel free to utilize the chat as well. Any questions that anyone would like to share? Um, I mean, I'll ask a question for me. It's what was it like, you know, how did you overcome the struggle of not being in the same space? Because both of you mentioned that that was, you know, the hardest thing and it, it is. Um, so how, how did you overcome that? How did you figure it out, especially when it comes to something like physical theater like this? Yeah, I think luckily this was our final presentation. So we had had the whole semester to practice um, and develop some techniques. But I think the hardest thing was wanting to have the shared props and finding things that looked similar. And I, the main thing we practiced was the, okay, this is how, this is when I'm going to reach over and when you're going to grab this and that's just how it's and this is what side we're going to reach on and working with zoom in that way was not ideal obviously but um a very interesting exercise one could say and it was definitely difficult 
but um, very fun and very rewarding, honestly, to, to have to find how to be physical separately, you know, be together and also completely not together at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Again, if there's any other questions, please place them in the chat so that both Lottie and Claire can answer them for you. Um, again, thank you so much. That was beautiful to watch. Um, I could hear, you know, our amazing Dean in the background chuckling. Yes, Dean Alexander, we heard you and you're on camera. We filmed you. It's, it's, it's on there. We got you. We got your laugh. We got it. And you know, we, we miss those things when we don't have the live theater. And so sometimes it's nice when someone was, is not muted and all of a sudden we, we catch them. So we love it, we love it, we love it, we love it. All right, we are going to now have Fossi, you're gonna be presenting next. So, you know, stage is all yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, so in a contrast, I am going to be talking all about technology. So, <laughs> <laughs> so switching gears. Okay, we good? Yes, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Fossi Lynn Bianco, and I'm going to be presenting on my work entitled Acrobat Acceleration, using engineering to effectively reveal new perspectives on choreography under the mentorship of Kristen Smirowski and Mary Trunk. So the purpose of this project entitled Acrobat Acceleration is to explore the concept of perspective through the creation of a dance film. Through a multi-phase process, I investigated how many different ways can we view the same choreography? And how can technology be used to effectively reveal multiple perspectives? So to prepare for this artistic endeavor, I worked with one professor in the electrical and computer engineering department, and then two professors in, um, in the dance department who specialize in dance and choreography for the camera. So, like it, yeah, I mentioned, I am a uh, electrical engineering major, primarily. And so um, I worked with one of the professors over there to develop an acrobatic shoe that tracks the acceleration of a circus performer's foot and uses this data to generate artistic data visualizations that respond to the performer's movement. I started this research back in June of 2020. And um, and so the acceleration data taken from this shoe gets wirelessly transmitted to my computer and they creates the art pieces like you see on the right. And so I conducted this research over last summer and throughout this year, the 2020-2021 academic school year, I've worked to now incorporate this um, technology into a more formal dance piece to present the artistic side of this work as well. And so I would like to show you a little excerpt from the dance film. So, in you, in trying to figure out how to utilize this technology within the piece, I decided to wear the shoe during the um, filming process and record my data as I was performing the choreography. And so this, um, this data was collected, the art pieces were created and they were overlaid on top of the video of the dancer as you saw in this previous section. So yeah, a little more about what these dots mean. You're probably like, what are these dots? They're just appearing out of nowhere. So um, each dot represents a different data point of acceleration. And the size of the dot or the diameter represents the magnitude of acceleration, which corresponds to how fast the performer is moving. So in general, the faster the speed of the foot, the larger the dot you see on the screen. Finally, the different colors represent the different axes, X, Y, and Z. And so you can tell um, the direction the performer is moving as well. And so like we saw in this previous section, as the foot um, slid out towards the camera, you could see the green dots um, explode in the middle of the screen. So that indicated the foot was moving faster than it had been before when it was stationary. And so I'd like to show another clip from the film that demonstrates this concept as well. Thank you. 
So in this, in this section of the piece, we saw two different movements um, uh, being um, presented. The first one was the coffee grinder, which you saw in the beginning, and finally the Hanson at the end. Um, the first one, the coffee grinder, which has its origins in hip hop and break dance, was the movement where um, the dancer was kind of crouched towards the floor and one leg was um, straight circling around parallel to the floor as the other leg was hopping over the leg sleeping. So in that motion, you could see the um, orange and green um, circular dots in the bottom left of the screen. And as the performer was um, moving, um, was moving the foot faster around the circle, the dots exploded out. And as the performer was moving slower, the dots came, um, shrunk, the dots shrunk. Secondly, the handstand movement, which has its origins in traditional acrobatics, showed the um, dots in a, in a different way. We can see the dots were, um, were drawn out in a circular pattern and the size of the dot didn't really change throughout the whole movement. That's because the handstand is a very stationary movement. When erected into the position, the, um, the foot stays stationary um, the whole time. So the size of the dot um, in response will not change and, until the performer comes down from the move. And I also just love this shot from the film because we see the dancer dancing within the circles and dancing with the art pieces, being one with the technology as we experience this art. And that is really magical to me and something I, I have, you know, aimed to try to, to try to produce with this work, figuring out how to incorporate technology in a way that's not gratuitous or distracting, but that can help us reveal something about the art that we weren't able to see before. And actually this moment of the piece happened coincidentally. Um, I filmed this with no intention of the dots being displayed in this manner. It was only when I started to edit the piece that this came to be. I really love this work because when I choreograph the piece, it starts off as one thing. When I film the piece, it becomes something different. When I edit the piece, something different. And then finally, when I add these, these dots or artistic visualizations, it becomes something even more magical. And so I hope these, um, these artistic visualizations and this film can give us a unique perspective on the choreography that wasn't, that could, could not be perceived before and could not be experienced without the use of this unique technology. And I just want to say, if you're interested in learning more about the engineering side of the research, um, I also had that in the undergraduate research symposium. And finally, um, this uh, dance film is being expanded upon and will be presented at the Spring Dance Concert in April of 2021. Um, so if you would like to see the future development of this work, please go check that out. And that will be under the same um, mentors Kristen and Mary as this project was. And I'm also working with a student who's going to be composing uh, a score for this piece. And finally, if you'd like to follow along and learn more about this project of technology and circus arts and dance, um, please follow my Instagram account at Digital Movement Art. And if you'd like to see the dance piece, I put it up on YouTube so you can scan the QR code to, to check it out if you'd like to at a later time. But thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much. My, I'm just like, my brain right now is blown away in so many different directions. I can't even begin to like articulate. And I had stumbled upon your Instagram and I was like, what is this? And I was like, oh, very interesting. And I was like, I can't wait to hear more about it. But now I'm just like, I need to see the movie. I need to go into your um, engineering. But what a beautiful reminder of how intersectional our art form is right, that you can bring in, and it's this reminder of like, of course we have this push towards STEM, but it really should be a push towards STEAM, you know, and like that inclusion of the arts and bringing that together. So thank you so much. I would love to open it up. Uh, we probably only have time for one question, but anyone else can put questions in the chats as well so that Fossi can answer them. Does anyone have one direct, yes, Ross, please go for it. So um, I, I don't know if this is a question, but I'll, I'm going to share a thought because I can't help but think about, you know, as a dance teacher, one of the things that is that we often use as metaphor is this idea that the movement that you 
are doing with your arm, your body, your head or whatever has this uh, kind of um, intangible radiation out into the space, you right. know? And, and that though that this as a teaching tool, I mean, it's one thing that it creates this product, but as a teaching tool to actually be able to see the impact of your movement on a screen, it, I think it can't help but um, increase the, 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 the reach, you know, I mean, the sense of the sense of your own personal boundary and then how much further the movement kind of radiates out if you can see it. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of made me think about that. And of course, tied to uh, Lottie and Claire with the idea of breaking boundaries in terms of melodrama and daring to be ridiculous. And then Lily with the feeling of that dance, the culture of dance training compresses and reduces the impact of the student in the space. So I'm just wondering how these, you know, Commedia dell'arte, this technology of, of actually visualizing movement and physics in the space, and then the radiation of the self and the voice and the, and the impact of the student in the space and how all of those can just kind of, you know, feed off of each other. Yeah, I think <laughs> one thing that comes to mind when you think of that is, um, you know, I find, I find these art pieces a um, sort of, you know, an expression of myself because I, I do find, you know, myself sometimes um, torn between, you know, the arts and engineering and sometimes I've, you know, previously felt I, I'm doing one and sacrificing the other at times. And so I, I love, I, I kind of, I love this, these art pieces because I feel like I'm expressing myself in, in a new way that is, is, is unique to both disciplines, you know? And um, I guess in terms of that reach, I was thinking about, you know, um, reaching in a, in a different way, radiating, my, radiating myself and my expression in a, in a new pathway, I guess. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Rob. Yes, yes. Fauci, thank you so much. I'm, I can't wait to see the progress of this. I'm so glad I'm gonna be following you. Um, this is just, just again, I'm just sitting here like processing still what I've seen and like what you're able to do, what is gonna be, how it's gonna be affected. And I can't wait to see its growth. And so congratulations. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, next is gonna be Daniel. Daniel, you are up next. Yes, <laughs> Daniel, yes. Uh, hi, welcome. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be quick. I'm Daniel, I'm a senior theater psychology double major. So yeah, I graduated in May, that's, that, that's a thing. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just try and be nice and quick. So for around 11 years, I started experimenting, making sculptures out of pipe cleaners and just with wire as a medium for art. And especially over the last four years, I've been exploring how to apply it to theater. And it eventually turned into my thesis project, which kind of looks like this which is essentially what I did was I created puppets entirely out of pipe cleaners. And with Johnny Byrne, the props master of the department, we planned and mechanized means for creating puppeteering mechanisms into the skeleton of these puppets and the designs I worked with and the mechanics are heavily inspired by both Bunraku and uh, Taiwanese glove puppetry, uh, such as like the company works done by Philly. Uh, beyond that, let's see, I had to write something. I had to direct, film, choreograph. I had to choreograph stage combat. I had to teach puppeteering to people with a r relatively no theater experience. My, my loving roommates and wonderful cast were very patient, even though none of them are here to hear me say that. So I had to combine almost every different mechanical skill I've learned over the last four years about theater into applying a relatively novel and almost abstract art form to a completely different environment. And I'm gonna pipe down now just to save time. And while my full film is 13 minutes, I'm gonna show five minutes of it and I will posts like the YouTube link to it after. So if people want to see the whole thing, they can. We are also not required. So there we go. So well, 
Welcome. The magical figures challenge accepted and an avatar conjured. The traveler's game begins. Spectre slain. The traveler guides his avatar towards their next prey. With the serpent fled, the avatar approaches its final conquest.
And so I'll end it there uh, simply because it's 13 minutes, but for example's sake, there were a total of six puppets I made. And yeah, I also, uh, between the roommate and I had to voice act a lot of the work along with editing and creating sound effects. So I guess I'd like to give the last chunk of time for questions if there's any. Yes, 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 Daniel. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Please y'all go to his little portal and see the whole film. And Daniel, feel free to put the link also in the chat as well so people can see it because now there's a suspense, right? And um, Daniel- oh, That's the part where the plot's clear. Right? <laughs> and I'd love to um, open up. Is there a question that someone would love to um, guess? Fossey, go for it. Where do you see the, um, I guess, the application of your work going? Would it be for a live um, setting or a film setting in the future? Just curious. Uh, realistically, it could go in a variety of directions. Um, a lot of Taiwanese puppet theater has actually been done for film, TV, and cinema. Oh. So while that application exists, when I was making this, before pandemic hit, I was actually considering trying to make it as a version of like kids theater and was hoping to maybe broadcast and show it off at a, uh, a school where I do service with my service work. Although obviously I changed plans. Originally, I did not intend on filming this. Got it. So the original intention was a live um... Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. And again, if you have more questions for Daniel, please put them in the chat. Um, Daniel, thank you so much. That was just beautiful to watch again. And again, I just get so excited. Um, our next presenter is going to be Robin. So Robin, please, the floor is all yours. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hello. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing. Um, my name is Robin. I go by the he pronouns, and I'm actually an English major. I'm not theater major or dance major, but um, I decided to kind of jump into it. And I will be sharing, or I'm gonna share my screen first. I will be sharing a spoken word, um, spoken word po poetry in a film format and like a home video format. Um, I'm sharing five poems that um, I wrote and such. And they're all based on um, this, uh, this idea of motherhood and mental health and memory and where I, I, um, oops, I went to, I'm estranged from my mother a little bit. So I um, decided to use this project to kind of observe and witness and um, try to experience a relationship with my mom in a way that I don't think I have had the chance to do so in the past um, to figure out um, what is motherhood like to me and what is it for her and as someone who is um, uh, like non-binary I you know not I don't I don't associate with being a woman like what does that look for me what does that mean um, what's what are the differences the similarities if there are any and um, a lot of this project kind of required that I really kind of delve into the personal and the intimate where I had to be confronted face to face with the honest fact of recognizing our different matrices. So recognizing that she's a brown Latina woman who's a non-English speaker um, who emigrated from the Caribbean, who's Catholic and a single mother, whereas I'm bilingual, brown, non-religious, non-binary college student and kind of figuring out or understanding how the cultural and generational differences and the systemic issues strain our relationship um, in a way that just like is, well, yeah, in the way how like, in the way that systemic issues kind of further exacerbate and cause um, the strain in our relationship. Um, and my methodology really included kind of basically becoming a hermit for the past year. So not only am I, is, are my social skills like shot just because of quarantine, but also because I just have been like in my little, artistic creative whole. Um, and I think more formally, this methodology would be considered like an ethnographic research, research method, but I like to call it shadow work, um, where I, you know, I journaled my experience with my mother, I took photographs, I videotaped the most mundane, you know, 
moments and situations. I recorded recipes that she shared with me, oral stories that she and other extended family shared with me, um, archived family heirlooms, uh, things like that. Um, and some of the things that I um, came across in this project was um, some issues that I don't know if I really took serious, like for example, projection, projection, like projecting traumas, projecting inner child wounds. Um, there was a lot of that that happened. And I think next time if I engage in like heavy topics and less nature, I'll figure out like a, a self-care routine that is more kind of, um, that more accommodates this because self-care is so, I'm starting to realize and learning that self-care is so essential and crucial for um, creative people because I mean, this shit is, excuse me, this, this stuff is complicated and difficult and seems easy, but it is not easy. Um, and I took a lot of inspiration from like, you know, films like, you know, Lady Bird is a, is a classic film that talks about motherhood. You know, we see that dynamic and how it's just like one moment that really kind of, uh, um, you know, I don't know, like stood out to me was the moment where like the mom was like, I love you, but I don't like you. That, that moment where it's kind of like, I really resonated with that in my relationship. And I kind of had that in the back of my head and albums like uh, Magdalene by FK Twigs and Blood by Kelsey Lou and books by, you know, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and all these like black womanists. Um, and also took a lot of inspiration from one of my um, good friends and I call him my creative dad, um, Kaylin Sabal Wilson, who is an LMU alum and who recently like was awarded the Pat Cavanaugh Award for their collection collection of poems called To Write About Home. And um, they were someone who really held a lot of space for me to kind of unpack a lot of these things. Um, where, so I didn't have to like do it alone, which is really nice um, because I'm an older sibling. So I don't have, you know, an older sibling to go to for like parent issues or like relationship issues, but they in a way kind of serve as like a, as a pseudo, pseudo sibling. Or, and yeah, um, I will, the film is seven minutes long, but I don't, I'm gonna try and just show maybe a portion of it. Um, and let's see if this loads. Okay, um, how can I make it? Okay. I remember blooming in your belly plucking petal after petal. They love me, they love me not. Oh, to be happy, oh, to be wise. Tell me the majestic moment of my birth, how I was a light to come out of your black carnivorous cave, the wide mouths which many men could not strive for unless it was to meet their grave, but I, the greatest warrior to be born from the mother of bulls brought forth past your envious right wing, stomping the walls and infinity decorating the left side of my thighs, cut my way with bright light shooting out of my chest, the shores of Manoa with men of red faces, bare breasted, layered drapes at their waist. Mother, your terracotta throne that has sunk to the bottom of the sea. Hunger angers all the dream puppies. Scraping butter from the tub, slapping onto black Teflon pans. So we claw the walls of blue veins and drink the liquid of old trees. Who said nothing? One million pieces. The self mutilation of the mind is willingness to fragmentize. The bull cracks her tail in the air, firmly planting her hooves, all while crying over the broken horns and tattered red scarves. Feathers stroke her snout, dusting powder from the wetness. I shove the stove right back in place, crushing the crumbs across the floor. Hang up the phone. We'll answer the call another day. I think you should write it on all your concept. concepts. I mean, I haven't really thought of anything new for this one. Besides the 
Hmm. How do you want your whole picture to look? Oh my gosh. What if we pretended to be like so My memory, a matted set of bed sheets, lined, pinstripe, light blue Tommies, tangled each morning in between my calves, snagging my ankles and folding in between my toes, disturbing the nails, snuggling the cuticles. No matter the bed, it would not change from the musk of a late September summer to an early February spring, frosted. I counted the day by each drop of rain that came from the hurricane. I came here for a wind to explain, choices to leaving duties disrespected. I am flipping through each cover, comforter speckled of dusty pink stains, scrubbing bleach monthly on something permanently placed. I lack some lessons in remembering my body. I find you in each pair of lovely eyes, pained and flinching inching next to you, but you've promised me right by fourteen. I left with my heart pinned, thorned throat, carrying a cry from a four hundred year old wave, washing back the dark hair it sucks back on my arm, sandy grind on my skin, sea foam follows my feet, and you came all this way just for me. is burnt pigeon peas and stirred yellow rice, objects of necessity and the pupils bearing each century. She didn't pick them bare like they did in La Yaya. No, she didn't pick them at all from the trees. I have never seen her hold a blue bucket with green cases of skin. She hasn't sat for hours in chairs with cracks in the legs and wobbling teeth. But she has flipped layers of dried grain, and she has juiced the chicken for seasoning. I tasted something spicier than when I was seven. Tongues do not hold memories like hands do. The flavor of sweat, the shine of browning skin, what made the bed break was seeing ages of tsunami. Crying pillows and drenched sheets, torn from one end to the other. Dragging. The mirror sees, but is kind enough to dissolve the object once misplaced from permanence. Um, okay, I think I will stop sharing for now. Um, there was like one minute left, but I wanted to leave some time for any questions and anything like that. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much for your vulnerability. Thank you so much for your honesty, your transparency, just coming into the space and, and giving so much of your work um, to us. You know, all of a sudden it's a group of people you've never met, maybe never even had class with, and here you are sharing and giving so much of yourself, um, not just presenting, but also with your project. So thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one question. Um, if there are additional questions, please put them in the um, chat so that uh, Robin can answer them. But is there, is there one question that comes to mind for anyone that they would like to ask Robin? Any one question?
Yes, go, Nano. Uh, uh, hi, Robin. Wonderful work, touching and powerful at the same time. Really, uh, uh, did because you're using so many things in this work. Did poetry come naturally as a first place to go to you? As a poetry came as a result of other thinkings and dealings and understandings and imagination and everything. Yeah. So um, poetry definitely is kind of feels more um, comfortable and natural to me. I just have. I don't know, I feel like I have this like unshakable trust in like words and like text and like the written word that sometimes it's like my detriment that um, it just felt like, okay, I have to start with words first because like the imagery and the vision sometimes feel like it's like too overwhelming to kind of like really grasp. So that kind of came after, like the imagery came after the words. Um, uh, and it is a lot though. I. I I call myself like a multimedia creative or creator just because like I want to do everything all the time. Like I want it all. So um, yeah, sometimes it turns out messy. Sometimes it turns out like a beautiful compiled piece, but I just, I just have fun with it. But isn't art messy? You know, it just is what it is. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Um, that was beautiful to watch. Our next presenter is going to be Gwyneth. Gwyneth, Gwyneth, Gwyneth. And um, let's see. Gwyneth, Gwyneth, Gwyneth. Do you go by Gwen? I do. Okay. Thank you so much. Gwen, the field is yours. I know you had to enter a little bit later. You were coming in from another presentation, moving on to this. I don't even know if you've had a break or not. I hope you were able to have a little break. Um, and so the field is yours. Thank you. I'll share my screen now. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. So my name is Gwen Tanner and I'm a senior dance and women's and gender studies double major. My presentation is called Embodiment, the use of artivism in response to gender roles in dance. Artivism or the synthesis of art and activism is a, is a dynamic catalyst for change. Dance as a form of activism can humanize socio-political issues and create a visceral reaction in choreographer, dancers, and audience members. My presentation explores how dance artivism can be used to challenge the socio-political issue of gender constructs through movement. I'd like to first take a moment to center myself in the work as a cisgender woman and how that experience can influence my research. I'd also like to be specific and say that I will mainly be focusing on gender in Western theater dance, but would love to expand this research to other genres of dance in the future. I conducted a study using qualitative data through 21 interviews with dancers across the field. Questions were crafted with socio-political issues in mind, including gender, race, class, and political themes. I chose to further focus on gender constructs within the dance industry. Gender binaries are continuously enacted in Western theater dance tradition through traditional partnering, the separation of genders at a young age, and movement that is described as being masculine or feminine. Through the insights gained from the interviews, as well as research into dance artivism, analysis of choreography, and personal experiences, I was inspired to create a dance film titled Embodiment. I will describe the ways in which embodiment aims to dissect gender and how gender is embodied through movement. I will also explore the various choreographic tools used to generate choreography and how they were in turn used to challenge typical movement patterns, gender representations, and the gender binary. When I began to physicalize the research, I had several different motifs and approaches in mind. One motif that I used throughout the piece was the movement of the pelvis. The pelvis is a central area when dissecting gender within movement. Just the act of a dancer sitting into their hip can represent a certain notion of gender to an audience. To challenge this within my own choreography, I tried to explore the many ways in which the pelvis can move freely. I had the dancers embody a specific movement of the pel pelvis one moment, 
and then let that idea go in the next moment. Moving in and out of such a movement, such as sitting into the hip or moving the pelvis forward or backwards takes the weight of gender off of that specific movement and transform it back into what it really is, which is movement. The nine dancers involved in the piece were asked the following questions at the start of the rehearsal process. When do you feel most free to express yourself? In what ways do gender roles influence your experience in dance? What does the word artivism mean to you? And how can artivism be used to challenge a socio-political issue such as gender constructs? The big question. Starting with a discussion at the start of rehearsal was important for me to foster a space to share common experiences as well as inform the mindset of how the dancers should approach the movement. All of the dancers added their own individuality background and experiences into the movement of the piece, taking my choreography, but truly making it their own to match their own experiences of gender in the field, and hopefully to push them to question how they have been taught to embody gender in the past. The film is premiering at the dance department's senior thesis show in April, but in the meantime, I have a short trailer to show. This trailer was made at the start of the movement invention process, and it only depicts me and not actually the dancers who will be in the film because that footage hasn't been shot quite yet. I think artivism is defined by the reaction of the audience not the intention of the choreographer. I used to always hate it at conventions when teachers would be like, if you're a girl, do this, and if you're a boy, do this. Mm -hmm. I think it also has this gender map on top of it where up until, you know, the start of the 19, uh, 1900s, 20th century, so many uh, company company directors were men, and most dancers were women. You know, so that there's a gender um, power dynamic going on. In America, it's turning into this like, okay, we're gonna sell sex. Like, we're gonna have this cis man get behind the cis woman, and she's gonna be the one here. And <laughs> It just like pigeonholes people and makes them feel less authentic, I think, a lot of times. Sometimes, like, I don't even want to do the girl part. Sometimes I'm like, I want to do the boy part. The girl part is not fun. All kinds of um, misogyny um, that is deep in the culture. Um, but I feel that the general world still plays a big part today in terms of, in terms of casting. Commercial world isn't like queer theory, gender theory, that they're not that friendly. For someone with this particular look, and you kind of have to examine it that further on, what do they mean by that look? Well, so that's like part of the gender roles thing is like the, from the bottom up, like you teach girls that it, like hip hop is more of a masculine thing. So then it's more guys into it, and then more guys end up being good at it. And then, Choreographers will pick mostly guys if they feel like that's what fits their style, which ends up isolating girls who like doing that style. All styles in jazz, ballet, hip hop, there is a lot of gendering, you know? There's a lot of, like, again, ballet, women, lines, men, you do the big jumps and you carry the woman. <laughs> and the innovation and the revolution is led by the young. And I think that has to be because, you know, they they haven't been infiltrated for as many years. It's just being super mindful and constantly, um, and with kindness, interrogating yourself and other people when it comes to gendering stylistics and dance. So my goal for the piece is to challenge typical movement patterns, gender representations, and in the end, push the dance community to evolve. 
I'd like to thank my wonderful mentors, the dancers involved in the finished product, the College of Communication and Fine Arts, all of the people who participated in the interview process and the Women's and Gender Studies Department. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. We have time again for possibly just one question. Um, and if there are other questions, we can definitely move them to the chat. We are definitely running behind, but you know what? I'm running the session, so so what? No worries. We have two more presentations and we'll have them. And we might have an influx of people coming in uh, in the middle of our last presentation, but that's okay. I will let people know um, that we are finishing our presentation and moving on with the second part. But I, I don't want to push anyone to feel that they have to be rushed and I want everyone to have the time that they need for their presentation. So I would love to have, if there's one question um, that Gwen could answer. Yes, Ross, please go for it. And I asked a question earlier. So if anyone else had a question, I didn't want to take over the time, um, but it doesn't look like it. So Gwen, <laughs> I'm curious about your decision to with the finished product to not have yourself in it. Can you talk about um, what that process was? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of people have actually encouraged me to insert myself into the final product. Um, but I actually wanted to use this as an opportunity just for professional growth of wanting to diversify my skills of wanting to be a director or you know a choreographer and a movement director and so this is my way and also I think it gives you a completely different view when you step back from the work and then also on top of that not wanting to insert me or you know myself into exactly what the work is and then to push the dancers to insert themselves into the experience and telling their stories of gender experience whatever that might be. So that was really my intention behind that. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Thank you so much. And we have Kyle. Kyle, it is your space now. Uh, hello, good afternoon, thank you. Um, so I am, my, my name is Kyle Friedler. Um, I'm not part of CFA, I'm a sociology major. Um, so this is a wonderful space to be in and see all the amazing work that everyone is doing. Um, I am, I don't have a presentation to share um, just because I just kind of wanted to talk about my project uh, that I will be presenting um, and kind of have a little more free form, like easygoing um, dialogue about the piece. Um, so if you haven't seen it, um, I did uh, film a dramatic reading of a play that I wrote um, for the symposium. Um, it's on the hub page. Um, and I will also uh, put it in the chat after I'm done, um, just because it's about nine minutes long and I don't wanna go too far over um, how much time we have. Um, so I figured I'd talk a little just bit about the inspiration and background behind the piece, share a little bit what it's about and then um, leave you guys uh, with the full clip uh, to view at your discussion. So um, I, wrote a play uh, over this past summer, thanks to LMU's uh, undergraduate research, um, summer undergraduate research program, as well as LMU's uh, honors program. Um, so I got funding for both of those and was able to spend uh, the summer working on this creative piece. Um, I, the first inspiration I had for this piece, um, this play, um, actually came from Boots Riley's movie, Sorry to Bother You, um, kind of this absurdist, uh, fictional, dystopic world that he created, I uh, found really interesting. And uh, I kind of wanted to replicate that, but also make it my own. Um, that was the original vision for my project. Um, and then the COVID pandemic hit and that kind of changed the world and changed my life. And um, I figured I had to do something related to um, kind of dissecting what was going on with the world um, because we were going through this, we are going through this super absurd moment um, in history. And uh, I kind of wanted to share my story, but also I learned throughout this whole process that everyone has their own short COVID story to share. Um, so I 
um, organized the play into uh, three acts, uh, each following three different sets of characters, although each, um, each act has involves all three storylines. Um, some of them intertwine, but um, they're not all super related. Um, and I um, kind of used that uh, structure as a medium to uh, share what was going on in my personal life, but also um, a lot of other things that I heard from friends, family members, um, and other acquaintances about uh, how a pandemic was affecting them as well. Um, <clears throat> so this, this kind of absurdist uh, critique of capitalism play transformed into what I like to call an absurdist melodrama, um, which aren't exactly two words that you hear together very often, but something I think that really defines what the play became. Um, and it, uh, well, yeah, so that's, so that's, uh, the official, I guess, genre of the plays, absurdist melodrama, um, kind of what I ran with, um, because it does get quite absurd, um, especially towards the end. Um, and I also wanted to thank my mentor who is <laughs> in the, uh, Zoom as well, Sarah McClay, was extremely helpful in providing me with a lot of resources uh, that develop my own playwriting skills. Um, as I said, I was a sociology major. I am a sociology major. I am not um, in, uh, aside from taking a creative writing course with her um, as a sophomore, um, I haven't had much experience with the English department even. So this was a whole new endeavor that I embarked upon. Um, doing something creative, um, but I had to add my own um, little like academic uh, experiences within it. Um, so I did actually perform a lot of quote unquote research for this project. Um, I reached out to a lot of different people, um, had a series of interviews that I did just to learn about what people were going through. Um, and that was a way also just to connect with uh, old friends and old acquaintances that during this, this challenging time of uh, quarantine and isolation that we've all been going through. So it was actually just a huge, um, amazing, fruitful experience that um, I got to collect a lot of different stories and then uh, work them into um, what I was creating. Um, she also introduced me to a lot of different plays um, that, <laughs> that guided uh, how I wrote uh, each scene as the, as my own play developed. Um, as I said, I never had, I'd never written a play. Um, I'd never even, I'd never taken a drama class. Um, so this was a great introduction into the world of playwriting and theater itself. Um, so I guess I'm going to kind of end it there and, um, link, uh, a Dropbox file to, um, a reading that I also presented yesterday. Um, if anyone would like to watch it, they're more than welcome to. Um, the play has unfortunately not yet been published or um, produced. Um, I, I almost, I was very close to getting it um, into a student-run theater troupe at Millikan University. Um, however, uh, they decided they needed, <laughs> they needed more, they needed more funding. So they decided to go with a bigger more well-known play, um, which is kind of which is kind of funny considering a lot of the themes that I kind of delve into into my work. Um, but um, that's in a work in progress is to get it out there into the world and hopefully soon, sometime soon, I'll be able to share more of it with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much. Um, just giving you a heads up, you are more than welcome to probably submit it with Delray players here at LMU. They're always looking for plays, especially this season. Um, let me know. Feel free to send me a message, Kyle, and I can put you in touch with the president of Delray players. And um, they've been producing new works this whole like COVID um, time. And it's been one of the things they've been doing. They've been readings and things of the sort. So um, please feel free to utilize all of the resources that we have here within the theater department, within our clubs, with theater. You know, you're in the space right now. You're getting to meet us. So please, 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 please feel free to share. Um, are Thank there you very much. 
questions. Um, um, I could probably, again, we could probably take one question and, um, you know, <laughs> I'll just do it, do it. <laughs> I love it. And um, we could probably take one question. Is there any one specific question that anyone would like to ask Kyle? No. All right. And so we have one more. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, one? Do we? Do we have one? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, Robin. Um, yes. Oh, my, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see. Yes, Robin, please share. Um, since you're a sociology major, what, I guess, like, got you into, you know, playwriting, like, because those two things don't seem to, like, match up, come together, but I guess, like, I wanted to know, like, is that just a personal interest, personal hobby, or did something inspire you? Uh, yeah, so I mentioned the creative writing course that I took as a sophomore, um, and that kind of was the big push, I guess, into the creative world. Um, Definitely my mentor, um, Sarah McClay, uh, was just very helpful in kind of being like, you should uh, do more of this, I guess. Um, and it just kind of went from there. Um, and I actually had a, so I, I'm, I mean, I talked about how COVID kind of transformed the project as a whole, but I actually had completely other different research plans for last summer. Um, and then COVID hit and changed what I was going to do. Um, and I needed some new sort of ideas and uh, it came from there. So that is how I went from sociology to English over one summer. I love it, absolutely love it. Kyle, just to let, let you know, my dissertation, so much of it is um, sociology. I took so many sociology courses to write my dissertation in theater so that I could be informed with what I was writing about. And so, you know, it is definitely a blend. Again, going sort of like the theme that I'm, I'm sensing from all these presentations today is how intersectional all of our work is and how the arts really blend into every single other discipline in beautiful ways. And again, I always push um, STEAM versus STEM and you know, for people not to forget that. And so I think you're also another beautiful example of this. So thank you so much. We have our last presentation um, from part one of our art showcase. For those of you just joining us right now, um, thank you so much for being in the space. We have one more presentation and then we'll start the visual presentations. And so let's hear from Kate one more time. Yes, Kate. <laughs> Let me share my screen again really quickly. All right, so I'm going to bring it home. Uh, my name, and for those who are just joining and haven't been here from the beginning, uh, my name is Kate Phillip. I am a theater arts major, dance minor, graduating in December. And for my second presentation today, I will be talking about directing theater during a pandemic. Uh, this project kind of came to fruition uh, during my directing for the stage class that I took last semester with Doctor. And I want to begin talking about how with directing anything, stage or virtually, you need to have content to direct. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be provided this in class by Dr. Secre. And in light of the need for more culturally relevant content and anti-racism work within the classroom, I was fortunate enough to be given the play Lima's Tale, written by the Black female playwright Lynn Nottage. And this allowed me to be able to do deeper research into topics and cultures that I had little knowledge about. And um, you need to have a strong understanding of the play and everything that makes up the play story in its entirety before ever even beginning to adapt the content from its written for the stage form to the virtual space. A little bit on this play, uh, it's based on a 2014 article by Damon Tabor that concerns the illegal poaching of elephants for their tusks and then the illegal trading of those tusks that results in high-end pieces of art. And it takes on an interesting perspective because it's told from the perspective of the elephant Malima and then his tusks um, after he is poached in the very first scene. And as I delved more into my research for this play, uh, it 
show some cultural context because I discovered that the genre of this play is a theatrical fable and that relates to the very important traditions um, and oral storytelling and fables that are prevalent in African cultures. So after an initial reading of the play, I began my research work on the basic parts that make up the story, identifying the main plot and themes so I could know what deeper research I needed to do um, before constructing my directing vision for the final scene that I would be directing. Uh, it's in these first stages of my research that I became uncertain how I would direct a scene from this play with the two classmates I was assigned as the actors who are both white, seeing as the majority of the characters in this play are African and Asian. Uh, but that led to some further research into the construction of the play itself and the way Lynn Nottage wrote it, which is a really interesting aspect to this play as well. Um, the 20 characters in the play are of all different ethnicities and they would be played by only three actors of different ethnicities. Um, exempt of Malima, who would, is the sole character that that actor would be playing, and it is to be cast as a Black African man. But everyone else is going to be playing all the other roles and playing multiple ethnicities within the show. Uh, so this really helped me go back and formulate my main theme of the play that I wanted to focus on in my um, directing vision, and that's based on the universality of the issue of um, this elephant poaching and human greed and corruption and environmental destruction for profit. From there, I did more of the standard research for context about the actual plot and setting for the play. I began with the very source and inspiration, the Ivory Highway article that I mentioned earlier, and then went into a deep dive about the issue of ivory trade and the statistics behind um, the elephant poaching and tusk trading, um, both at the time that the play was written in 2014, as well as what it's like today. And once I had read Tabor's article and um, I knew its influence on the production, but still did some deeper digging into um, Lynn Nottage's creation of the play, what um, her process was like, what kind of research she conducted prior to writing the play, um, just to get a better sense of her intention for it and her message and how that can be incorporated into what I present with my actors. And then ultimately I did the most research into the cultures represented into the play to get a better understanding of the characters and their individual participations in the journey um, that you see in the play of the tusks from elephant to display case. And then it was time to really start developing my directing vision and bringing Nottage's words into performance. So I began with some script analysis and then devised my vision for the entire play. Uh, from there, I broke down each character and got a better understanding of how they all fit together in the journey of this play. And then I selected a scene and began getting the actors involved. And I wanted to still be very conscious about my casting, and that led me to select scene 11 from the play. Uh, it mentions no specific names or pre-written, or and has no pre-written dialects um, for the characters to imply certain things out of the context of the entire play the way Lynn Nottage wrote it. Um, it also worked out well that this scene is one of the more crucial scenes in the play, uh, it handles the traveling tusks and is really the point at which the global scale of this issue and of the corruption becomes prevalent. With my scene solidified, I then got to work uh, directing my actors and directing during a pandemic. So that took a lot of adapting what um, would be a stage performance into two actors' homes completely across the country from each other and over a computer screen. Um, there were a lot of challenges based in that, some regarding how do I block my actor's movements in spaces that I have never been in, I've never seen, um, and that I'm not physically in with them in the moment. How do I get the props and the lighting to look as similar as possible in order to create a cohesive piece and get the right message across? 
um, as well as what do we do if the connection drops or the lines don't overlap because of Zoom lag. So all of these were problems confronted throughout the rehearsal process and required constant communication between the actors and I. And I allowed myself to be extremely open to their artistic ideas as well to better ease all the entire process for all of us. And with that, I will present the piece of theater we were able to create in a virtual space. I also want to shout out my amazing actors, Eliza Black and Jimmy Darling. <laughs> Sit. Sit. May I see your identification? Can you tell me what this is all about? I'm only in Vietnam for another day. I haven't finished my logs and I was hoping to get out of here. Where are you time. coming from? Malaysia. Port of origin. Mombasa. May I please show me your documents? As you can see, all of the declarations and certificates for the containers are current and up to date. What's going on? Why am I being detained? Can you please tell me why I'm being detained? Everything is in order, but there is one container in question. Really? Which Don one? Don Locke Enterprises. I, I don't recall all of the names of the companies. Did you inspect all of the containers? Yes, all of them. You did. Yes. Is there a problem? It appears you have no documentation for the ivory. Ivory? Oh, but I'm not carrying any ivory. The manifest lists the contents of this particular container as timber, but my inspectors examined it and found over a ton of ivory stowed beneath the wood. Again, do you have the proper certificates for the ivory? No, I don't, but I didn't That's know that I was- paperwork? Yes. You need further documentation. Look, I wasn't aware that I was transporting ivory. This container must have been loaded without my knowledge. It, it happens sometimes. I'm carrying a shitload of cargo and sometimes- Because you don't have the proper documentation, the ivory is considered contraband and there are penalties. Look, I have no idea how it got onto my ship. I just transport the cargo. I'm not responsible for what's inside the containers. Please. Please. You said you inspect each container. Yes, I do. I did. It's procedure. And? I don't know what to tell you. Can you confirm that the cosignee for this container is Donlock Enterprises? I don't know if that's what it says. Yes or no? Yes, if that's what it says. Are you familiar with this particular company? I don't know. Perhaps. Can I make a telephone call? I'm sure I can clarify everything. Of course. Excuse me. Mother fucking hell. Son of a bitch. Sit. I'm afraid that you're going to have to remain here until the representative of Donlock Enterprises arrives, or- no, no, no. I have to coordinate the loading of my next- I can't release you until I have further clarification, unless there's something more that you wish to share. I can assure you that I had no prior knowledge of this transaction. You, you, you can look at my manifests. 
Is there someone else I can speak to? Are you aware of the penalties for transporting contraband? Yes. But of course there are fines that can be paid to avoid this problem. I'm sorry? Fines. Oh. Do you understand? I do. Look, um, I didn't know that I was carrying. Yeah, that doesn't matter. I wasn't prepared. Perhaps Mr. Locke will be better prepared. Perhaps. So what do you think we should do about this? You're asking me? I would like to know your opinion. The container is not mine. And therefore I take no responsibility for its contents. If things were to go missing, I couldn't vouch for them. Does that answer your question? That adds a great deal of clarity. To be clear, I'm not a friend of Don Locke. That is good news for both of us. Am I free to go? Your paperwork appears to be in order. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there one question anyone would like to ask before we conclude our part one of our arts showcase? Um, I would love to open up to at least one question for Kate. Um, does anyone have one question? Yes, Fossey, go for it. Thank you so much. Can I ask more about what the, the makeup was representing or meaning? Great question. And I knew that was gonna be a question. <laughs> Um, it's a really cool element of the play that I wanted to still incorporate, even though we were just doing one scene. Basically, um, from the get-go, Malima would be, once he is poached and is then the actors representing the tusks, throughout the play, he increasingly gets more and more white powder and makeup on him until the very end when he is like just the lone tusk sculpture. And what I was representing through this and what it was represents through the play is um, as, because each scene is different characters as the tusks travel from Kenya all the way to China. And so as it's being passed from one person to another, they're kind of affected with that stain of um, being a part of this poaching and killing of mm. all of it. So that's what that's representing is um, at that moment and that specific moment that I chose for Eliza to go put the makeup on is when um, the tusks have been completely passed from Jimmy's character to Eliza's character and now they're going to travel from Eliza's character to another one. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. This sounds so good. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you everyone who's come in to the performing um, arts section. Thank you everyone for all your contribution, your research, your projects. Just beautiful, 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 beautiful work. Thank you so much. Um, we are now going to slowly transition to part two of our visual arts um, 
presentations. So those of you who are here for the first half, thank you so much. If you want to stay, you're more than welcome to stay. For those of you who've just entered the space, we will be beginning very shortly in about a minute or less, but I just wanted to give the space for the transition and to say thank you so much. And I'm going to end also the recording that we have. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much.